Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Mailbag. My name is Damo and Clarky is also here. And it's fantastic to be here on another Clayton Oliverless week. Yeah, as a member of Melbourne, I need you to go down to Gosh's Paddock and put Oliver through his paces so he's ready for next week. I cannot hold him any longer. I'm just saying, for the record, the man has been relatively injuryless for many years now. I think he's probably due... Like, just a, a little bit of an extended run to sort of no, make Clarky. sure he's 100%. Clarky, we need him back. Anyway. It's Geelong, we'll be back. <laughs> this Maybe week's Clarky. guest is co-host of the Supercoach Co-Captains podcast, and you may recognize his name as he does send questions through every now and then. It's Pado. Thanks so much for coming on to the show, mate. Thank you, Damo. Thank you, Clarky, for having me. Long time listener, first time caller. So, super happy to, to be on this week, and um, yeah, cannot wait. Clarky, how is your team looking for the round 15 bye? <laughs> not good, Damo. Not good. Things are not great. Um, with Oliver being out, it leaves me with very little. Uh, I'm just trying to do a, another... I count this probably once every few hours and just to check to see if it's any different. Um, but what am I looking at here for... 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. A big 1-5. Um, I'm just going I've, to... I've come to terms with just copying it this week, I think, because very technically with my trades this week, I am at full primo. So next week, things will be... The sun comes out tomorrow, as Annie said. I don't think... You're going to be the only one in that boat, Clarky. Pato, what about yourself? Have you got 18? Uh, I'm looking at 17 if Sean Darcy returns and all accounts that he is back this weekend. So that will get me to 17 if we get a random Jack Bytel or Harry Arnold, who I traded in a couple of weeks ago, hoping that he debuts soon, um, will get me to 18. But to get more than 40 from him would be a miracle. I've got 17 myself, but I don't feel confident in Campbell Chesser holding his spot. So um, maybe ends up with 16 there. It's going to be a difficult week. Um, community, you're not the only one if you're struggling for numbers. Just get through the week and just remember one more week of buys and then it's back to a normal super coach week from then on. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people it was kind of you either had this week was your bad week or last week was your bad week. So, you know, as always kind of shakes out with the buys. Um, depending on your trade situation. I know the Jock Reynolds boys in the in the group chat have made me feel very inadequate considering I only have three trades left after my trades this week, which is it's feeling spicy. Um, like Colgate toothpaste spicy though. So it's not too bad um, in the grand scheme of things, considering I'm at full primo. So I think it's as long as you come out of these buys, finishing your plan, you can cop one bad week. Like realistically, it's not going to absolutely destroy you as long as you're setting yourself up for the coming weeks, because you can make up a couple points here, like a hundred, hundred points is you know it's a good captain score, really, like a good captaincy option, and just nailing those on field scores away from really maintaining a competitive rank you you mentioned captain scores probably being a big difference and pato you were you tweeted out the other day you added up all your captain score and got the average and was like eh, it's not too bad only a couple of scores under 100 you know seemed to go pretty well and i did it for myself and it was an eye-opening experience i should say yeah, averaging 128.8 on the season, uh, which is it was a little bit surprising to me. In previous years, I've gone a little bit risky with my VC options and just gone something left field. But I've, I've decided this year to, to be a lot safer with that VC, tried to target an early round good matchup. And it seemed to have paid off this year. And it helps when you've got a guy like Bonton Pelly is pretty good plan B on a C if your VC doesn't get over 115. Juicy, 128 is really juicy, Pato. So well done, man. Like that's, I've absolutely bottled a lot of a few captains this year that I'd rather not go back and check the stats on. Yeah, uh, after I saw the tweet, I went back and did mine, and and I and, and I had Laird's 50 in round one, which probably brought the average down quite a lot. But even then, I 
I should have banked a lot of VC scores. It would have put me 10, 15, 20 points better on the, the week most times. And it doesn't feel like a lot, but if you add it up, that's it's, it's quite a lot of points in the end. It's, it's hard though, because if someone gets 115 to 120, like your head says, yeah, you should probably take it. But you, you want to chase the ceiling. And when Bontempelli is dropping 160 plus scores every couple of weeks, it seems, and it's really easy to get sucked into temptation and just chase that. So yeah, it's tough. Definitely is tough. We'll get to the questions now. And there's lots about ruck setups, especially for those who have jumped on Kieran Briggs over these buy rounds. But we'll start off with ones a little bit outside of the square just to begin, just to get them out of the way because That's it's right. going to be because it, it's going to be a long discussion. Um, we got to keep the juicy content in the podcast, Damo. Get the retention. It's, it's, I like it. it. It's, it's, it's going to be a long discussion. And just remember, um, listeners, you're not le- you're legally not allowed to skip forward through the questions to get to the one that you want to hear. The first question comes from Ian Lloyd on Twitter. He wants to know, should he trade Jaden Short to Lockie Neal to give him another primo um, in his 18 this week? Or should he wait and get Libba next week instead? Why is he, why are you trading Jaden Short in the first place? Like Lucky Neil Libba, great players, but Jaden Short's doing the thing, isn't he? I gotta I gotta check the math on if he is doing the thing. I understand. I think that so this is a question that I think, in the nicest way possible, comes from the panic of going, oh, I don't have eighteen. That's going to absolutely destroy me. And it's like, well, okay, like, you know, that is a, a decent concern, but. Jaden Short's not having a, an awful season, and you're still going to be spending about 60k. So Jaden Short, 534, 300. Lockie Neal, just under 600, so 599. So you're sort of paying 60 grand for some points this week, which I don't think necessarily adds up over, you know, say the next 10 weeks, where Richmond have, you know, West Coast and Hawthorne and North you know, within their next games after the bye. Sorry, North is round 23, so not as close, but, you know, and Sydney at the MCG. I think there's there's probably merit to be had to holding short and saving the trade. Pato, it looks like Andrew McWalter has Jaden Short back in that half-back role where he has been known in the past to pump out 140s every now and then. So I don't think that trading Jaden Short actually gives you anything more or less trading them to to um, Neil or Liver, but it's whether or not using that trade is actually useful to the team at all. Yeah, 100%. Um, I'm a Richmond fan, and uh, his role under McWalter has actually been really, really good. It's been half back for the last three weeks. Now, the 89 against Frio uh, was slippery conditions, and it was the Shea Bolton show, let's be real. And uh, sorry to remind you, Damo. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, the halfback ro- ro- role is what, makes him really appealing. And Jaden Short will pick up DPP in a couple of weeks just before playing a nice juicy game against West Coast. So I I see the merit in holding. I'd rather hold, have a short than a, a Jack Steele in my team, personally, even in midfield. Jaden Short was one at the beginning of the year that I kind of thought about starting because I knew that he was going to be pretty solid and pretty safe with his scoring because he was one of those players that – yeah, he kind of frustrated you in that midfield role, but he still had that really nice floor. And early in the season, that floor is kind of something that you look for in the primos that you get because you want the players with the high ceilings, but you also want the players with the safe floors. And Jaden Short kind of ticked that box, especially if he was to move to that half-back role after the acquisitions of Hopper and Tim Taranto. So I think you hold Jaden Short. Lockie Neal is someone who you probably want in your finished team. Liberatore is someone who you probably want in your finished team, flying under the radar a bit. But I don't think cutting Jaden Short is the way to get to them. There is a scenario where I think this is okay, which is you are already at full premium. You have extra trades. Say, you know, you're close, like one maybe away from full premium and you're sitting at let's say uh, uh, eight plus trades, I'd probably say you can afford yourself one luxury trade. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a touch of like Jack Sinclair about Jaden Short scoring as well, where it's like, no, 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 I want you to play in half back. <laughs> like, 
don't don't give him the mid time. So I think, yeah, I think there's merit to sort of holding him this week unless you're super desperate or you have factored in a luxury trade already into your plans. Good point. Good point. Next question comes from Jay on Twitter. He needs to bring in two rookies under 200k in the forward line. Who are the best options? So he's mentioned players like Angus Sheldrick, um, Ryan Marrick, uh, those sorts of players. Those two would probably be the top two under 200k in the forward line. Um, If he can find another 3k, I don't mind the look of Marcus Windhager either. Yeah, I'd probably go with one of those ones that you mentioned. I'm just having a look through the list now. It's oh, it's barren. It's, it's a bit of a wasteland uh, as you go through it. I think, like, if you want to be, like, really distant, juicy, Tajwo Woden has been an emergency for Melbourne for, like, the last four weeks. So maybe. But I think I, think I like um, Windhager the most he just seems to have a pretty solid role within that 22 for st kilda just a touch over 200k though but not that much so if you can find another 3k to make that trade happen then i really like the marcus windhager trade who who would you um look at pato yeah certainly marriage i think is basically a lock this week if you don't already own him Another one to possibly look at is Buller, although he was subbed out last week, but he does play West Coast. So if he does happen to hold on to his spot this week, I can see him possibly having a bit of a sort of 60 or 70 game, which could come in really clutch in a week where we're all scraping to to find 18. So that's not a horrible option, but if you can get up to a Sheldrick, I think you'd probably feel a lot safer with that. Although Sheldrick does feel a few weeks away and a couple of blokes coming back into that team away from a, a possible green vest again. And I'm not sure you want to be trading into that because a lot of people are holding the likes of Constable. And I mean, I've had Jack, Jack Bytel since round one and just sitting in a barren wasteland on my bench. So it's it's really tough. So I think you want to be sure that they're going to get games. And Marich obviously ticks that box. As long as he's uh, walking, he is absolutely playing for that West Coast team. And uh, just that second one is really tough. I think um, Buller was a bit a bit unlucky to have to go up against Harris Andrews in his first game, so I think the sub was purely tactical from that aspect. Where you know you've got this this guy who's really talented, but then matched up against one of the best one on one defenders in the entirety of the AFL. So coming up against some easier opponents, I'd probably say that he holds his position as well while they're waiting for Buddy to get right. Um, so yeah, I, I do. I do think Buller, if named, is probably still a reasonable option against a uh, struggling West Coast. I thought I read that uh, Buddy was actually back this week, Clarky. So oh, juicy! I just I made it happen. <laughs> Jack Buller is going to be a very good player, but he did look a little out of his depth against that Brisbane defence, but. There are lots of tools in that Brisbane defence, so there was plenty of uh, matchups for him. Um, wait and see tomorrow. <laughs> I guess we'll wait at team selection. But last I heard, Buddy was still dealing with an, with, with with a knee issue. So we're all got different inf- in, in, information. We've just got to wait and see at team selection. And if Jack Buller is there, he is certainly an option that um, you can look at. Jay, hopefully, we answered your question. Now, these next three questions are all kind of connected. So we'll answer one and then the other and then the other because I've I've ordered them in a way that I think makes sense. The first one is English Marshall Briggs, which two average the most for the remainder of the season? That's from Brenton on Facebook. English and Briggs. Only because I there's just something about like when I watch Rowan Marshall, right? Like you, you just I don't get that spark from the way that he plays and how he scores his points. Like I know he pulled out a ninety in really challenging posi- like um, conditions um, during the Richmond game, and it's like yeah, that's that's great, but it's Briggs is really doing it and he's playing in a way that I think is really 
magnetizing to Supercoach scoring because it's all hard contested stuff. So he's following up the ruck contest. He's playing like a big body. It's literally like Shane Mumford 2.0. I said last week or maybe the week before, Kieran Briggs is basically Toby Nankervis again for Adam Kingsley. Yeah. And you can see it in the way that he uses him too. So I think English and Briggs out of those two de- probably average the most for the remainder of the season. And that's only because St. Kilda's second half of the season, I know a different coach, haven't been great. And it seems to be indi- – and, and it seems – and their performances seem to be um, indicative of super coach scores. So when they win, they've got good super coach scores. When they lose, they don't. And I think if St. Kilda do have a pretty average back end of the season, I think that can affect the likes of your Steels, your Sinclairs, your Marshalls. And it kind of makes me feel okay with people trading one of those, trading a Marshall so that Briggs is on their field after the buys. You look at the matchups as well for St. Kilda. Um Marshall, another one of those ones who's been really hammered by a restrictive ruck. So we've got Oscar McInerney. Then is Bailey Williams still the West Coast ruck? I couldn't tell you. Who cares? Um, you've got Grund- Grundy, Grundy, Gondy, Gondry, anyway, uh, against Melbourne, Wits, Goldstein, Ned Reeves, Mark Pitney, Nankervis. Like, I just, I don't like the matchups for Marshall comparative to, I don't think Briggs, like Briggs hasn't been as impacted by those matchups because of the way that he scores his points. I don't know if that's, if that's fair to say on me pulling that out of nowhere, but I've had a, as a, based on that Adam Kingsley <laughs> Briggs comment, I wonder if you have any more insights. Yeah, I certainly agree. I think in terms of averages, I think English and Briggs will absolutely be, the two highest averages of those three. However, I think total points, Marshall gets the edge, obviously, because he doesn't have the buy this week. I I get the sense, and maybe it's the conservative nature in me that thinks that Briggs may end up hitting some sort of physical wall at some stage this season. And that's why I'm leaning towards trading out Briggs this week. It helps my buy, but it also helps me get to, to 18 quicker. So, look, it depends on the rest of people's teams, but I can see a world where yeah, Briggs in maybe a month does hit a bit of a wall and maybe they go back to Flynn because Flynn has been putting up pretty solid numbers in the VFL as well. So a bit of an embarrassment of riches there in the in the ruck division. And yeah, I, I, I can see it happening. So I think if... So I'm one of those people this week, I've traded Rowan Marshall out and kept Kieran Briggs. Now Rowan Marshall helps me get Zach Merritt. So even though I'm trading out a playing player, I'm kind of, as I said, I'm willing to cop it to have Zach Merritt this week. Um, and I, But I think I think you are right where there is that concern of, well, how long does Kingsley stick with Briggs? And I think Briggs's body of work is kind of showing it. Like Flynn, even though Flynn is talented, um, he just hasn't quite had the same impact that Briggs has had on the GWS game. And I think that also benefits Briggs that he's being played in the back half of the season predominantly like he's only really played three or four games up until now then he's going to rest this week which means that they can really campaign because the Giants are well within a chance for the eight as as well like they the upcoming schedule they've got some easy they've got a couple of easy wins in there but there's a lot of games that are 50 50 I think if depending on which Giants turn up um, so I think you could, you could make a case for both sides, but I think if like me, um, I'm trading, as I said, I'm trading out Marshall, keeping Briggs, but I've also brought in Darcy Cameron this week. So I've kind of got a semi contingency where if Briggs does end up getting rested for a long period, I can move Darcy Cameron into a ruck who is admittedly not going to score as well, but by then Briggs will have enough cash in him that I could reasonably bring in a suitable replacement in either my forward line or my midline. And that probably brings us to our next two questions. So I'll read them both out. 
Um, for those with Kieran Briggs, is it worth trading out one of English and Marshall for Darcy Cameron? That's from Don from John DJ fifty nine on Twitter, and Paul on Facebook wants to know: Is Darcy Cameron a must have considering his value and rut coverage while sitting at F five or six? I don't know if must, I don't know if Darcy Cameron's a must have, but he certainly makes things a lot easier if you do have he's, that trio. He's juicy value though. Like that, like that's it. I think he's he's a buy in terms of value at four sixty four. He is DPP ruck forward, so we're covering even if you hold Marshall English and like you're running English and Marshall or even Wits, you're covering in case one of those guys goes down injured because we don't know they've got injury history. It could just happen, so you've got the coverage there. He's coming off a buy prime position. He's going to probably average, let's say, on the high side, maybe 105. On the high side, at worst, I'd say probably 90 to 95 with a couple of spike games in there. Pato, do you think that Darcy Cameron's a must-have? I don't think he's a must-have. I think Clarky ticked on all the points that make him a really attractive trade-in. We did a bit of an analysis over at that there's Supercoach co-captains of his fixture um, on the on the run home, and it's actually a little bit tricky. So he plays Adelaide this week, which is absolutely fine, but then he plays the Suns, the Dogs, Frio, Port Adelaide, Carlton, Hawthorne, Geelong, Brisbane, and Essendon. So... Hawthorne and Essendon sound like good matchups, but they've actually conceded low scores to opposition rucks all year. So I don't feel like the ceiling is completely there. Like the value is great. So if you're bringing him in at 460K or whatever he is, I think you're okay with a 95 average, uh, especially because it's sort of compounded by the fact that he also provides cover. So if English, who is has a bit of a history of soft tissue and concussion and stuff, he misses a week, it's easy to, to cover that for a week. If you've got a Darcy or even a Marshall, like Marshall has obviously quite a long history of his, of injuries as well. So I think that the, the security is makes him really attractive, but I don't think he's a must-have just because of the run home. And Pato, would you okay. trade out one of English or Marshall for Darcy Cameron to keep Kieran Briggs on the, on the field? It's all team dependent, but if you can still field 18 by turning Marshall into... A, a Darcy Cameron, I don't hate it. Would it be fair to say, not not wanting to speak for you both, but would it be fair to say that I don't think there's any world where I I could advocate or any one of us can advocate for trading out English in that in those two options. You're trading you're trading Marshall really if you own him. English will be the number one ruck for this year. He has shown it the way the dogs play, the way he plays, even though he's an injury risk. We bought him for a reason. He's back and the dogs are kind of flying at the moment. So um, I just, I don't think that we can advocate for that in any sense. Yeah. I wouldn't trade Tim English. I think Tim English is basically another midfielder at this point for the Western Bulldogs. Yeah. And um, funnily enough, before he became 205 centimeters, he was actually a big bodied bid in under 16s before he had a massive growth spurt. So it's taken him a little while to come on as a Ruckman, but now he's showing that he can be a midfielder and a Ruckman in sort of the same mould. So I I wouldn't get rid of Tim English. It's basically like having another midfielder in your team, but Rowan Marshall is, an, is another one altogether who I think, yes, he's playing this week and adds to your numbers, but I don't think he, he's a must-have for the run home. And if you can cull him to make your team a bit stronger for, for a bit of a push, then um, I don't see any problem with moving him on. Yeah, and I think while we're talking Darcy Cameron um, as an F6 option, which I think is probably where he'll sit firmly for a lot of people, um, I like. He's, it's another thing where I'm like, okay, well, the downside is 95, but surely we still take that from a forward option. Like, I think we've been very blessed this year that let's be honest the top six to eight forwards are all midfielders it's tim taranto it's josh dunkley it's connor rosie it's errol goulden it's Canelio, it's mccray like 
we've got this endless list of like, and none of them are pure forwards. Like we're cooked for next year. <laughs> it's going to be rough for next year if they don't maintain DPP. But I think at this stage, it's like, well, I, you know, you kind of have to go historically. You take ninety plus from a forward, right? Like, am I crazy? Am I misremembering? Like, I feel crazy, sort of going like, well, you know, don't like Darcy Cameron should be on the shopping list, really. Like, because who else is there? It just reminds me of uh, I think it was a couple of years ago. Lek Dog and I first podcast of the year. The team picker opens, and we're looking at the top twenty forwards and. Sitting at 19 on total points was Lincoln McCarthy. Only averaged 79, <laughs> 79.8 for the year or something, but because he played every single game and he had a pretty good floor, pretty good, like, like pr- pretty safe scoring sort of range, he was a top 20 forward for the year. So I think 95 is a, is, is a really good average for a, for a forward, especially someone who is a forward, not someone who has forward positional um, eligibility and plays in the midfield. So I'm looking I, at it now. The... I think Darcy Cameron is a good option if you can get him in. And you don't necessarily need, need to colour Ruckman to bring him in either. There might be a couple of rookies that you can pair together to go one up, one one down as well. Because some people might not have jumped on Kieran Briggs because they had nowhere to leave him during yeah. during during the buy rounds or no way to use him. The... um. The first forward, the first pure forward to be in the top forwards by total points, uh, Charlie Kerno at number 12, Jeremy Cameron at number 13. From 11 to 1, they are all either defender forward or mid forward. It, it makes you think about next year's team picker. Your, your, your top forward could have, could have averaged 91 and be... Jason Horn Francis or something, and that's and that's kind of scary to think about. I can't wait for the first week of preseason where everyone's saying I'm not paying 700k for Josh Dunkley, and then they pay 700k for Josh Dunkley anyway, and then he scores 50 in round one. I hope that doesn't happen again. <laughs> Sorry, Pato, we've just been <laughs> ranting. No, no, it's fine. I was, I was thinking that um, I think you're foolish to trade out the third highest averaging player in Super Coach, all positions included, and. Even if you hold English and trade Marshall, I think English still gets twenty more than English uh, than Marshall over the course of the season, and that makes up for it. So if you have to turn Marshall into a D cam or or something else, I I still think long term English does make up for that. Excellent. Round fifteen is going to be difficult, so nailing the captains is important. Who are we putting the VC and C on this week, guys? I missed last week where I didn't have to worry about whether my team was going to do good or not. Um, Christian Petrarca against the Cats. Why not? Um, Reece Stanley is back this week, so I don't. Put to, I'm not sure how I feel about Gorn, although Gorn loves the Cattery. Um, but out of that first game, probably the only two options you'd really consider. I like Lockie Neal against St. Kilda on the Friday night, especially considering Ross Lyon has said they won't be tagging him. So I assume that means they'll be tagging Josh Dunkley instead, however that looks. You trust um, Ross Lyon? I don't, but I like Lockie Neal anyway. Pato, who have you put the blue armband on? Uh, I've got the blue armband on Dunkley, although I'm also open to switching that to Neal. Just for what it's worth, I feel like Petrarca gets a really hard tag from Blitzavs, who's been named in the midfield for tomorrow night's game. So, And he scored 90-odd against them last year, where I'm fairly sure Blitzavs also went to him. So the, I feel like they'll really target him. Um, either of the Brisbane mids I really like against St Kilda. I get the sense that Dunkley gets matched up on a, on a Jack Steele who's currently struggling to walk, let alone run. So... I feel like Dunkley could go a 150 plus again. And over the last three weeks, he's averaging about 150. So This might be contentious, but I don't think I would recommend any of the Sydney mids against West Coast. Mainly because I haven't really had a time where I've got, like the few times that I've VC'd Errol Goulden, uh, not, it's not worked out. Like 
I, I'm very worried that that's not going to be the high scoring game that we expect it to be. But I do low key like Zach Merritt against Frio. Because Zach Merritt is Zach Merritt, and I want to celebrate the first week I'm owning him. For captaincy, I've I've gone for Rory Laird against Collingwood, but that is not locked in place just yet. I also like the look of, um, to be honest, not a lot of options this week. I like Nick Dacos against against Adelaide, but he could get tagged by Ben Keys. I think um, he, I think he's runs with him, like he. You just got to, like, you got to make the attempt if you're Adelaide. And the the other one to look at is um, Jake Lloyd against West Coast. West Coast don't good. generally um, lock down on the running defenders. Um, Mason Redmond scored 144 against them just a few weeks ago. So sim- similar roles could do a fairly similar um, output, um, Jake Lloyd. So he's another one to consider for... Even if even a VC, if you're prepared to VC a bit later in the round, yeah, I think that probably at the moment I'm looking at my team. Uh, I've currently got the VC on Dunkley and the C on Merritt, so I'll probably stick with that. That seems fine. Yeah, VC Neil, C Laird, hoping Neil can get the job done, so I don't have to worry about it for the rest of the round. But Pato, how about you? What's what's you currently locked into? I think it's worth noting that since Dugowie went out of that Collingwood team and Jack Crisp replaced him in the CBAs, that they have allowed really big scores for those inside mids. Now, King's birthday, they gave up 156 to Jack Viney and Rory Laird's a little bit better than Jack Viney. I do rate Viney. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Hang <laughs> on. Don't jump down my throat there. But I can see a similar sort of scoring effort against Collingwood mm. by Rory Laird. So... I, I locked into one of the Brisbane mids as VC, and I really like Laird. Merritt's not a bad backup option. Um, I agree with Clarkie. I believe you said that against uh, Frio. I don't think they have a really great matchup for Merritt, and I think he'll sort of roam uh, that Optus Stadium and, and do as he pleases against Frio. Damo, what do you reckon about either of your Frio boys, Brayshaw or Sarong? After last week, I want to see. <laughs> I, I, I just want to see effort. I don't care what they score. I just want to see effort. I just want to see oh. a team playing like a team again. If if they, I feel. if 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 they look like they did last weekend again, we may as well just swap them for Peel and send Peel out the week after. I've 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 opened a wound there a little bit, uh, and I apologise for that, Tamo. But I think Brayshaw did get to a respectable one hundred and seven. Considering the absolute drubbing that was going on. I don't know where that performance came from, to be honest. Like, they looked okay against Richmond. Like, it, it, it was a post-buy performance against Richmond. One, one, one of the classic post-buy performances against Richmond. And then they come up against the Giants in Sydney, and I don't think they turned up. I think they got left to the airport. Yeah. Anyway, that's all the questions for today. Thanks for joining us, Pato. Thank you for having me, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure and, um, yeah, it's been awesome. Community, make sure you go and listen to the Supercoach Co-Captains podcast, available where all good podcasts live. And, Clarky, thank you again for being here. It's always a pleasure. I, am, As I said, I'm very looking forward to just getting the stress out of the way tomorrow night uh, or tonight by the time this comes out, depending on if it comes out on Thursday or Wednesday night. Uh, And yeah, may may all your last buys go well. Remember, if you have a question you'd like answered on the next episode, all you have to do is tag your question with Jock Mailbag on social media or send an email to jockmailbag at gmail.com. And we'll talk next time.